recording because I know I messed up there. But anyway, hello again and welcome to this in a latest series of keyboard performance videos that I've been uploading. And if you've been following them, then you'll know that essentially I'm documenting my own keyboard learning progress. However, because I'm a qualified tutor as well, and I understand the theoretical side much more than I'm able to practice it, I do feel compelled to teach you some of the things that I do know about music. Now, in the last video that I uploaded, the Walk on By video, I had a comment from my old school friend and former sparring partner, Paul Coward, and a uh, I can't mention his name without smiling because we were both very mischievous, uh, perhaps renegade children back in the day. Uh, but we did have a super fun time growing up in the small leaf district of Birmingham back in the day. Anyway, Paul, he lives in America now. He made a comment saying that he would very much like for me to perform, perform something with a reggae feel next time. So I went away, had a bit of a think about it and Rather than play a reggae piece on the keyboard, I decided it would be much more prudent um, to perhaps do a video tutorial instead. And the reason why is because the piano or keyboard or synthesizer or organ in reggae music, it actually performs more of a supporting rhythmic role rather than a lead one. It's very rare that you're going to find a piano dominating a reggae record from start to finish. Um, and in all honesty, the role of piano in isolation in reggae music, it is actually quite monotonous. It is quite boring on its own. But, you know, when it's complemented by the other instruments, such as the, the rhythm, the lead guitars, the drums, the bass, uh, the brass section, the vocals of the artist, that's when the piano, its part helps to form the whole sum of the piece. Now there's going to be quite a bit of music theory in this video, nothing too advanced and I will try to break it down as simply as I can. But whether you have an interest in music or not, do stick with it because, you know, even when it gets a bit boring or it might seem a bit complicated, because the objective is, you know, simply to get you to understand the typical role of a keyboard instrument in the genre of reggae, um, reggae music. Now we mentioned rhythm. And we alluded to the fact that the keyboard, it typically plays a rhythmic part in reggae, as does the rhythm guitar, incidentally. Now, it would be remiss to proceed without first defining what do we mean when we say rhythm? Well, let's look at a dictionary definition of rhythm. It's a strong, regular, repeated pattern of movement or sound. Strong, regular, repeated pattern of movement or sound. So we can see some keywords already in that definition. Um, regular repeated pattern. Now there are lots of examples of rhythm even in the, in the natural world. Um, one that springs to mind quite quickly is your pulse or your heartbeat. Um, that beats to a regular repeated pattern uh, if we had a stethoscope, we could probably hear my heart, but you know it goes boom, 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 boom. I'm getting nervous. In fact, if my heart was beating that fast, <laughs> I'd probably take myself up to the uh, cardiothoracic unit. Um, another example of rhythm in the natural world is walking. Now, we all walk to some sort of rhythm, um, and if I just pause this lesson plan, stand up. Um, my head is probably obscured, it's probably gone out of range. But yeah, we all walk to some sort of rhythm. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. So that's like a marching rhythm, a very, a very natural rhythm and a rhythm timing, incidentally, to which a lot of music has been composed to in the past, especially like military band music. It's composed to the time, timing of the way we walk. But that's looking at rhythm, uh, regular repeated patterns, remember, in regard to movement. But we're more interested in regular repeated patterns in regard to sound, and moreover, with regard to a reggae sound. 
Now reggae is generally a rhythmic based genre of music with the drums and the bass underpinning everything else. But we're looking for that regular repeated pattern as it applies to the keyboard, piano, organ or guitar. And if you do follow reggae music you will have heard it. It's a very characteristic feature of the genre and it's a pattern that usually sounds something like this. There you go. Like I said, if you do follow or like the genre, you will definitely have heard something like that in most of the reggae records that you're listening to. Essentially what I was doing there is playing chords in a staccato fashion. And we're going to look at chords in much more detail later on. In fact, I'm going to split the video up and probably make it into a series because I think it will be too long to um, impart too much information too quickly. So we'll look at chords later on, but suffice it to say... Those are two different chords that I'm playing, and we can define a chord as being three, three or more notes being played at exactly the same time. That's the definition of a chord. And this, this particular chord, three, we call it a triad. Try for three with try prefix. Anyway, I also used another technical term, a uh, music term there, staccato, which means that the note or notes are sharply detached from the uh, other note or notes, as opposed to legato, which is more, which is, well, the opposite meaning, without breaks between the notes. Uh, I'll show you what I mean. Um, if we were playing staccato, it's, you know, from one chord to the other. You can hear there's a break as I lift my hand to move it over to the other chord. Whereas legato, it would be smooth. It would be. There will be no break. The notes will be joined up. So that's what we mean when we say staccato. So there you go. You've heard the pattern, the rhythm of those chords. And if you are a fan of reggae, then without, without question... Uh, you will have heard it in the music of a genre. Now, in some quarters, they call that feature, oops, they call it the skank or the chop, and when it's complemented by the left hand, they can call it, or they do call it, the bubble. Um, however, it's not just the pattern that gives reggae music its distinguishable sound. It's more to do with where that sound is actually played in relation to a bar or measure of music. Now, to explain what I mean, we're going to have to... Excuse me. We're going to have to look at some beat theory, which in itself is a very extensive topic. But because we're trying to condense the theoretical side to get to that practical outcome... I'll, I'll try, I'll try and give you an overview without going into too much details. So then, whether or not a piece of music has drums or percussion, there's always a beat or pulse that's implied. And there has to be really, because how else could you dance or nod your head or tap your toes in time to the music? Anyway, hopefully on the screen, to aid the process, there should be a grid, hopefully. It's not standard music notation because uh, I think that would be too complicated for a lay person to comprehend. However, at the end of a chapter, when everybody hopefully has a general understanding of beat theory, I will supplement this ad hoc grid with the standard music notation as well. Right, I'm going to actually immediately contradict myself because I'm going to quickly flash up some standard music notation momentarily. And if you look, you can see a portion of what we call the staff in music. Um, that's those five lines. You've got a sign next to it, that's the treble clef sign. And to the left, um, well, two numbers as well. Now, don't worry about the staff or the treble clef for now. Like I said, I don't want to make it too complicated. Um, we're just concerned about those numbers and 
moreover the top number rather than the bottom one. We're not going to concern ourselves with the bottom one for now. Essentially, what is being communicated here is how many beats to count within a bar or measure of music. Now, when we say a bar or measure of music, and I'm deliberately uh, using the two terms interchangeably, because if you learn music in the UK, more likely than not, your tutor is going to call it a bar, whereas in America, they call it a measure. But what the bar or measure is, it's actually a representation of a portion of time. And that number on the top denotes how many beats should be played within that portion of time, within that bar or measure. And in this instance, it's four. And we're using four simply because it's probably the most um, common time signature in Western music, Cer certainly in popular music. And you might indeed even have heard the term 4-4 four, four time or common time. They literally mean the same thing. Indeed, in written music notation, you will sometimes see those numbers 4 over 4 replaced with a big letter C, C, <laughs> which stands for common time. Now, if you're a fan of dance music, house music or garage music, you will almost certainly have heard the term 4-4 four, four because there is actually a subgenre of house called 4-4 four, four music. But just to reiterate, we're talking about four beats to a bar or measure of music. And we would count it thus. In fact, let's count it and clap it out at the same time. So four, bar, four beats to a bar, simple. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So as you can see and hear, the four pulses or beats are very uniform and evenly spaced within the duration of the bar and also in our ad hoc grid. Now the beats themselves, they do have technical terms and beat one is specifically called the down beat and beat four is specifically called the up beat. This is in correspondence to the direction taken by the hand of a music conductor. Now, you've more than likely seen music conductors in the past. You will have seen them with their baton. Uh, but what they're actually doing is communicating the beat non-verbally to the uh, musicians in the orchestra. And uh, I'll demonstrate. So if I had to hold with my pen, oh, I'll just use my hand to substitute for the baton. Um, invariably, the conductor is going to start here at the top. And then he's going to come down, he's going to move to his left, to his right, and back up again. So effectively, he's saying to the orchestra, the downbeat, one, two, three, upbeat, four. One, two, three, four. So there you go. Anyway, the beats do actually have generic terms as well as those specific ones. And beats one and three are generally known as on beats, whilst beats two and four are known as off beats. Now, the reason for that is because beat one and three, beats one and three are effectively the strongest beats, whilst two and four are the weaker beats in any bar or measure. Now, let's expound on that and let's demonstrate it as well. In music, like I said, beats one and three, they are the most logical and most likeliest places for a chord change and or melody change. Um, I do realise that I'm diverging a bit, but stick with it because it should all make sense in the reckoning. Also, it does actually make sense to relate how reggae differs from the standard standards and conforms of other music genres. So, we mentioned chords earlier and we did mention that we would look at those in more detail in the second video. Um, but for this demonstration, suffice it to know, I'm going to be playing three chords in a sequence. I'm going to be playing, what am I going to be playing? <laughs> yeah, C major, which is there, F major, and G major. Oops. Oh. G major, so C major, 
F major, G major. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to actually, I'm going to play these chords, but I'm going to move between them when the beat or the count strikes either beats one or beats three. Um, I'll use the left hand to tap out the pole, so I'll count it as well. So let's go. Watch for when I move and change the chord. On what beat do I do it on? Two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now that sounds, yeah, all well and good. Let's do it again, but this time we'll change the chords on beats two and four and hear the contrast and hear the difference. Two, three, four, one, two. Started off on the wrong chord, that was D minor. Sorry. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And you hear that was it was kind of off because it was literally on the off beat and you know that's why in that example you can hear a change in the chords on the weaker beats i.e. on beats two or four it didn't sound logical it didn't sound mathematical and I actually broached the term mathematical deliberately because at its base level that's all music is it is literally the mathematics of sound Incidentally, that little example is also relevant to um, mixed DJs, and I'm diverging again, I know, but if you are a prospective mixed DJ, be mindful that when you are syncing your records together, make sure it syncs on the downbeat, on beat one, not the second beat, not the third beat, and certainly not the fourth beat. Invariably, you have to sync your mix on the downbeat otherwise your mix is going to sound off. But we diverge. Let's get back on track. Well, we looked at why beats 1 and 3 are considered on beats and why 2 and 4 are off beats. But the goal is still to determine on which beats do we play our reggae staccato skank. Well, let me answer that. We don't actually play the skank on any of those four beats. Where the skank or chords are actually played in between each of the main beats or pulses and it's that unique positioning in the measure that gives reggae its characteristic feel and sound. Alright then, uh, so before, before we put that into practice on the keyboard let's look at how we're going to incorporate the spaces in between the beats into our verbalized count. Now because we're already vocalizing the numbers 1, 2, 3 and 4 we need to vocalize another sound to go in between the one and the two and in between the two and the three and the three and the four and we can simply do that by saying the word and so this time when we count the bar we'll count it thus one and two and three and four and in fact let's clap it out as well and at the point excuse me, at the point which we bring our hands together to, to form the clap, that will be synonymous with one of the four main beats or pulses. And at the point at which we separate our hands, that will be synonymous with the word and. So come on, let's clap it out together. Two, three, four, one, and, two, and, three, and, four, and, one, and two and three and four and so that's how when we divide the main pulses we would count it if we're adding something in between the main pulses one and two two and three and three and four we add the word and um, I hope I hope you got that. I hope I've both have made it simple enough. But let's put it into practice on the keyboard. And remember that we're going to be playing our staccato chord at the points in the count where we say and. So if you've got your keyboards that are ready, if you're following on with your keyboards, we'll count it. Um, 
and obviously I'm going to be playing the chords so I can't clap it out one hand can't clap and uh, one hand can't clap that's a Jamaican <laughs> proverb um, which is obvious because you can't clap with one hand but I'll tap it out on the keyboard so two three four one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and so there you go that's how or rather where in a measure of music to play the skank in the reggae genre but we're not quite um, done yet we do have a left hand to consider as well now the left hand actually mimics uh, the chords or the notes that the right hand is playing but it plays an octave lower so um, should we should we explain should we explain octave in this um, I think yeah because we're going to do the second video and we're going to go into more detail um, about chords and notes and scale constructions um, so basically what we're doing we're playing the chords for the skank pretty much in the middle of a keyboard and the left hand is going to play the same chords or notes but an octave lower like I said we'll go into much more detail about octaves in the second video um, but I think we can uh, put, put it into practice how we play the left hand in reggae music but I should have yeah if you are following on I, I was remiss I didn't um, actually remember to tell you the, the notes that we're playing for the chords we're playing two chords G minor and C minor and the notes that make up G minor are G, B flat and D and the notes that make up the C minor chord are C, E flat and G okay well like I said the left hand plays those same chords as the right hand but it's playing an octave lower or two octaves that's entirely up to you but it plays in a different position in the bar or measure like the right hand skank it's not going to play on any of the main pulses i.e. the one two three or four it's going to play in the spaces immediately before and immediately after the right hand skank so if we refer back to the grid we can see that we've already established the main pulse the main beats on the one two three four positions of a measure we divided each pulse up into four and established that the right hand skank plays in between uh, in between any two pulses smack bang in the middle and um, the, of those divided pulses you can see that to the left of the and and to the right of the and there is two more available spaces and that's where the left hand plays so anyway now before we play let's add two more terms to identify the position in our physical and vocalized count now we're already saying the numbers one two three four for the pulses and we're saying the word and for the division between the pulses but what can we say for the uh, two remaining available positions in the count well we can say this for the first one we can say E and for the second one we can say A ah. I know it sounds a bit bo uh, bizarre in isolation but it is actually standard music notation and we count the whole thing thus one E and A uh, two E and a uh, three E and uh, four E and uh. so that's gonna help us to keep in time and especially in relation to the um, left hand in fact before we actually get to playing it in the keyboard and putting it into practice um, I think it might make sense to uh, clap it out like we did before but this time when we bring our hands together to make the clap 
that will be synonymous with the main pulse or beats and it will also be synonymous with the word and and then when we separate our, our, our hands that will be synonymous with the sounds E and the sound R okay so let's clap it out two three four one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a okay I hope you've understood that and um, if you're not you can rewind if not you can rewind the video go back and um, and try to get a bit better uh, understanding of it. Now we're ready to put it into practice on the keyboard and remember the left hand although playing the same chords as the right hand it's playing down an octave. The position that it's playing within the me uh, measure is at the points where we say E and R in the count. Okay so obviously I'm going to be using two hands now so I'm no hands can't clap, that's my own proverb. So we'll, ca we'll count it vocally anyway. So let's go. Remember the left hand is playing on the E and A of the count. The right hand is pl still playing on the AND part of the count. Two, three, four, one, E and A. Two, E and A. Three, E and A. Four, E and A. One, E. And a two e and a three e and a four e and a, and there you go. That's where the left hand plays, and and hopefully you'll have understood all of that, and we've achieved our objective of getting you to play and or understand a characteristic reggae feature of a skank. One thing I must add though before we do wrap up is that when you're playing, don't play it mathematically or mechanically or, or robotically like we just did, even though that is technic technically correct. Make sure you add some human elements and this is one of the things that computers can't do unless you program program it to do it of course and that's to play with what we call you know humanization syncopation and quantization and a bit of you know a bit of swing so we're not going to play it mechanical like one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a we're going to add that swing, we're going to add that flare, so it'd be one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a you know, add that humanization. I mean, we are humans after all, we're not machines, we're not perfect, and it's those imperfections, whether good or bad, uh, that separate us from our mechanical counterparts. Anyway, that's a wrap for now. I hope you've understood most, if not all, that we set out to do. And remember to look out for the second part in this series. We'll look much, much more at structuring the chords, how we chose those chords, how we determined them. And we'll look at scales, and indeed, we'll look at all the notes and rhythmic patterns that constitute this simple composition. And hopefully, you'll be able to play it as well. So, I'll look forward to seeing you in the second video.